Um, my name is Sarah Stahl. I'm the Spanish instructor and the coordinator of the Cultural Awareness Club, and I would like to welcome you to Surviving the Holocaust, which is presented by um, MAC History Department, the Department of Modern and Foreign Languages, and the Cultural Awareness Club. And I would like to introduce you to Edith Rogers. Um, Edith Rogers is a Holocaust survivor, and she would like to tell her story so it never happens again. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. Quite a crowd. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. Some of them have heard me before, so you just have to put up with it again. <laughs> I am a Holocaust survivor. I was not in a camp, but they were after me too, so I'll just tell you the things that happened to me. And one of the reasons I'm doing it is because we can't let it happen again. People say, well, why do you still talk about it? It happened so long ago, which is true. It's been a long time. And unfortunately, there is not too many people that are still around from that time. I'm one of the youngest survivors, and I'm, I'm going to be 86 next month. So if I'm one of the youngest, you know there is no older ones left. So that kind of tells you the story. Now, I know most of you are aware of the fact that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. I don't know how many of you were aware that six million non-Jews also were killed in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that. There were all kinds of other people besides Jews. I happen to be Jewish, but uh, like I said, there were many others. Hitler went after, or the Nazis went after everybody that didn't agree with them. I didn't know I was different from anybody else when I was a little kid. I mean, I was just a baby. <laughs> and uh, when I turned about six or seven, I was all excited because now it was time for me to join the Hitler Youth, the girl part. And you get to wear uniforms and march and wave flags and sing songs and all that stuff, and I was really excited. And for some reason or other, I couldn't join. And uh, that's the first time I ever found out that I was different from anybody else. I mean, why couldn't I join? And why did they say I was dirty? I was <laughs> clean, but it was always dirty too. It was never just being a Jew, it was always being a dirty Jew. We got used to it after a while, we just got used to it. Anyway, that was my first real introduction to being different and to be uh, quite different from the rest of the world. But it was, when I look back now, of course, it wasn't a big deal. It was mandatory for everybody to join, except for kids like me. But uh, when I look back now, I say, well, who cares what was the big deal? But when you're six or seven years old and you're the only one that's different, it is a big deal. The next thing that happened to me, which was quite more traumatic, I was living with my foster family because my mother, le my mother had left me with these relatives because she saw what was coming. How she knew, I don't know. And in fact, I do it in her memory is why I still speak about it. That's my mother. She didn't make it, neither did my five-year-old brother. But anyway, we had, my foster family had this housekeeper. Her name was Miss Simon, wonderful lady. She was just as sweet as could be. And one morning we got up for breakfast and we went out in the kitchen and where is breakfast? Where is Miss Simon? She's not there. And my foster dad, and I'm going to refer to my foster family as mom and dad because after all I started living with them when I was two and a half so they were like my parents. Anyway, dad said, well she must have overslept. She has a room upstairs. Go up and get her. So I ran up there and her room was open and I went in and she wasn't in there. And so I went looking for her and there was a part of the attic up there that was not finished off and it was off limits to the children, which of course turned it in our favorite place to play. <laughs> <laughs> and I found her. 
She was swinging back and forth from one of the rafters, just swinging back and forth. Now, I was probably around eight or nine years old. And I started pulling on her and screaming, you better get down, you didn't make breakfast, you're in trouble, oh man, are you gonna get it? And I think up here I knew that she wasn't gonna come down, but in my heart I couldn't, I couldn't quite accept it. So I ran back downstairs and I told him what I'd found and uh, in all the years I lived there, it's the only time my foster dad ever cursed and my foster mom, she just, she just fainted. Well, they told me that later, Miss Simon had gone away and she wasn't gonna come back. They actually expected me to believe this. They always expected me to believe all these nice little tales. I was the best eavesdropper you ever saw. <laughs> they never told me the truth because I was just a little girl, not old enough to understand or cope with anything like that, so they would just tell me all kinds of nice stuff. So anyway, Miss Simon had gone away. She wasn't going to come back. Well, the next thing that I remembered worse than anything was I had just turned, uh, let's see, I had turned eight, I think. Let's see. Uh, it was November 9th, 1938, so I had just turned seven a couple of days earlier. And Dad came in and said, come on, we're going uptown. And he wrapped me in a blanket and carried me. And we went uptown or downtown, and there were all these fires and all this noise and all this screaming and yelling and music and all of that stuff going on. And he told me I should remember this for all of us. I should be proud of my heritage. And some days the Nazis were gonna get what they had coming to them and all that. And I kept saying, yeah, 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 I will, I will. When in reality, there was only one thing on my mind. Oh my God, I'm a big girl and he's carrying me wrapped in a blanket. What if any of my friends see me? That's the only thing that mattered to me that <laughs> night. In retrospect, of course, it was the night of the broken glass, Crystal Nacht, where they did all that stuff, uh, unbelievable stuff. In fact, they, uh, they roamed all the gangs, and I lived in a big city, so there was plenty of places to go. And some of the things were, well, they burned down 101 synagogues, and if anybody doesn't know what a synagogue is, it's a Jewish church temple. That's a synagogue. They burned down 101 of them. They destroyed 7,500 businesses. It's a little bit more than they're destroying in St. Louis right now, but they started out the same way by breaking windows and burning them down and so on. So keep that in mind. They arrested 26,000 Jews and sent them to concentration camps. Now remember, this was November 9th, 1938. World War One didn't break out for another, I mean, two, didn't break out for another year. But that's what was going on a year before World War I broke out, I mean, World War Two. And they also beat 91 Jews to death. Just Bludgeoned them for no reason at all. So that was something that I remembered later on, but like I said that night, I, who cares? I just don't want to be seen. I, uh, I had, like any little girl, I had a crush on somebody. <laughs> Dad had a business of his own, and over there, they had what they call apprentices, but not like here. An apprentice was somebody that didn't want to go to university, and the parents would pay someone else to teach them. Like if you were a carpenter, you would teach them how to be a carpenter, but your parents would pay for it, for you to become a carpenter. And so dad had this apprentice, his name was Manfred. 
Oh, he was so good looking. <laughs> and uh, especially in his uniform, but he never wore it when he came to my house, so. He, Dad wouldn't allow him to wear his uniform, but I saw him on the street a couple of times. Anyway, I had a big crush on him, and I decided as soon as I was old enough, I was gonna marry him. Of course, he didn't know that, but that didn't matter. <laughs> so, uh, one day Dad came home, and he was crying. Never seen that man cry before. And he said that Manfred was dead. And I said, that, that can't be right. There was no air raid last night, so he couldn't have been killed. And he's not old enough to be in the army, so he couldn't have been. Just a mistake. What happened? Well, we'll tell you when you get older, you're just a little girl, we'll tell you someday. Here we go again. So that night, of course, I had to listen at the door. And he was telling mom and uh, what had happened. My friend was in the Hitler Youth, of course. And his group of young men, boys actually, from 12 to 15 year olds, had a Saturday meeting. They were told to bring their weapons, whatever their weapon was. I don't know if it was a pistol, a revolver, I don't know. And each one of them was assigned to walk with this elderly Jewish gentleman. And for some reason or other, these elderly Jewish men all had shovels. Each one of them was carrying a shovel. And they went out to some wooded area where nobody else was. And then these Jewish gentlemen were told to dig a hole and they were told exactly how deep, how wide, how long. And when they were done, they were told to stand at the edge of it, facing the hole. And then these young boys, now remember, they're between 12 and 15 years old. They were told to shoot them so they would fall into the hole and then carry you know, put the dirt back on top of them. Well, it seems Manfred's best friend said, I'm not gonna do it, I don't even know that man, I'm not gonna shoot him, uh-uh, no way. So the leader, who was of course an adult, the leader should Manfred shot Manfred's best friend and then shot the two. What do you think the rest of the boys did? I mean, you can say I wouldn't do it either, but don't kid yourself, you probably would do it because you can't, you can't save this man. All you're gonna do is kill yourself. And I guess uh, it uh, affected Manfred, so a couple of weeks later, he did what they call ate his gun, he killed himself. That was very dramatic for me. It was one of the most dramatic parts for me but there were a lot of other things. Of course, there was a book burning. And like I said, there were six million people that were not Jewish that were killed. Now, there was one group in particular that they went after. I mean, come on, what can you do with a mentally, physically challenged person? What good are they to Hitler and his gang? We don't need them. But we don't want to spend money by sending them to concentration camps, so let's just find another way. So they did. They took those big vans, you know, the utility vans that don't have any windows in the back, and they put the physically and mentally challenged people in them. I'm sorry, that still gets to me. And uh, they took them out in the woods someplace again, and uh, they put as many as they could in there. And when they got there, they put, uh, somehow put a hose on the exhaust system and sealed it inside and closed it and sealed it and took off and then came up, came back later. I don't know how many hours it would take, but they came back later and buried them. That's how they got rid of a lot of the physically and mentally challenged people. Can you imagine that? You can't, neither can I, but that's what they did. That was one way of, a cheap way of getting rid of the people that were not helpful to the Nazi parties. I myself was lucky. 
that they never caught up with me. There were times when they were looking for me, and for some reason or other, the family always found out when they were looking for me. And either dad or mom or one of their daughters who were in their 30s. Now remember, my foster parents were in their 70s, 60s, 70s, because their daughters were in their 30s. And he would, whichever one, would take me to the nuns, Catholic sisters. And I have to tell you, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for those sisters. There was five of us kids. There were two rules. Rule number one, never ever tell your last name or your address. That way, if one of you kids gets caught, you can't turn the others in because you really don't know who they are. And the other, unfortunately, was do not ever let the priest see you. Sounds terrible, but it was a fact. Now that does in no way mean that all priests would have turned us in. What it means is some of us, did, some of them did, and who knew which ones they were? They weren't saying, having a sign on them saying, I'll turn them in. So the rule was, do not let the priest ever see you. So if there was an air raid in the middle of the night, we couldn't go to shelter, which is stayed with the nuns, and uh, they would pray with us, and they were, like I said, they were fantastic. They prayed with us, they even did Reading, writing, arithmetic was us as much as we didn't want to. <laughs> and uh, they shared their little rations, which weren't very much to begin with. And uh, if there was an air raid, one of the sisters the next day would go, they of course knew who we were, would go and check our homes and see if the place was still there, if the family was still there. And that was big, big help. And. Uh, after the war, I went back to see the sisters, and I was the only one that ever showed up, so we don't know if the other four kids, we don't know if, if they survived, and of course, like I said, we didn't know each other's name or anything, so I don't know if any of the others actually uh, made it or not. I did. To all of those, you know, and then there was a book burnings, which we saw, which, uh, People thought they just burned Jewish books, but that wasn't the case. They burned anything Hitler didn't like. It didn't matter who wrote it, German, Russian, American, English, you name it. If they didn't like it, it was burned. And they burned a lot of them. I mean, <laughs> there was one day where in Berlin, they, at one burning, they burned 10,000 books. I don't know how many books are in here. <clears throat> Probably a couple of thousand, maybe more but they burned 10,000 books in one day. And while they did that, they were, of course, marching around in their brown uniforms and singing Nazi songs, what they call patriotic songs, which they weren't. And there were a lot of other things that happened. For instance, every male had to take the name Israel in every Every female had to take, sorry, Miss Saw, uh, we all had to take the middle name Sarah. Don't ask me why. Nobody ever told us, but Israel and Sarah were put on every Jewish name. And of course, no Jew was allowed to teach or have a profession or anything like that. That stopped instantly. And they went after a lot of different things. They passed so many laws, it's unbelievable. Now, most people, of course, think the concentration camps started in the middle of World War II. Mm -hmm. Hate to tell you, Hitler became chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Okay? The first concentration camp was opened March 22nd, 1933, two months after he became chancellor. Okay, it wasn't a death camp. It was more like a, a prison, you know, where they put people that didn't agree with him. There were a lot of communists and such. But 
it started instantly. They passed so many laws that it was just unbelievable. Now, I remember all of this stuff happened before World War II, which didn't start in Germany till September 1939. So all of this stuff happened years and years before World War II. And, and you sit there and you say, how was that possible? Why didn't anybody stop it? <clears throat> I can't give you an answer to that. If I ever find the answer, I'll put it in the headlines because nobody has ever found the answer. How did it happen? And then, of course, when the war started, it got worse. Like, for instance, there was an incident in Poland. <coughs> now, they went into Poland on September, I think, 2nd, 1939. On December 27th, which is the day after Christmas, they rounded up 107 non-Jewish, non-Jewish, Polish men. Just rounded them up in the middle of the night and shot them. Why? They felt like it. They could do it. Nobody stopped them. This is the kind of stuff they did. As far as uh, the camps and everything, I was lucky I didn't get to one. My mother did, my brother did, some other relatives. Of all these things that I've told you so far, the one thing that probably was the hardest thing for me to accept was I loved school. I just loved going to school. And I was in fourth, fifth grade, and we had a big assembly. A couple hundred students and teachers, everybody in uniform that day. Except there was this one little girl who wouldn't allow, wasn't allowed to have a uniform, which was me. And there was a boy I'd never seen before. He also wasn't in uniform. And they called the two of us up front. Like I said, it was about four or five hundred kids, something like that. And they pointed fingers at us. And they told the assembly that we were dirty little Jews. Here we go again with the dirty. We were dirty little Jews. We had no business being there. That we were contaminating the school grounds and we were tainting their blood by being in the same rooms with them. How that happened, I don't know. But that's what they told them. And then they told both of us to get the, you know what, out of there and never set foot on the school ground again. To me, that was the most horrible thing that happened during all those years. I ran all the way home screaming and crying, and uh, the family, of course, got very upset, and uh, my foster dad, dad, he said that he was going to have me better educated than any of those little Nazi blankety blanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a mixed audience. I can't use the words. <laughs> and uh, that... Uh, he was going to see to it, and I said, yeah, sure. I had already reached the point where I didn't believe anything he told me, but I knew he loved me, so I went along with it. And as it turned out, he actually did. He hired this, this professor, nice little old man. <laughs> Hated him. <laughs> he hired him. This was a German man, but he refused to join the Nazi party which meant he could no longer teach. So dad hired him to teach me. <laughs> he did. I tell you, nobody ever had a teacher like him. If I made a mistake on page three, could I fix it? No. He tore it all up and made me do the whole three pages oh. over again. So you know I really, really hated him. <laughs> I tell you, that old man, and he was old. And I remember I was around 10 or so, and he was in his 40s, so he was an old man. <laughs> Sorry about that, but to me, he was an old man. God bless him. Oh, I forgot to tell you, when I got kicked out of school, that night, the Gestapo, which was uh, German Nazi, secret police or whatever you would translate it into. They came to, the, to my teacher's house 
and they arrested him and no one ever heard from him or about him again. His family never found out what happened to him. I mean, everybody could guess what happened to him. But I guess he had, tried, had changed my papers and that boy's papers and who knows how many others he might have saved, I don't know. But they came and got him and he was never heard from again. So he was German and obviously he was a member of the party. He wouldn't have been teaching, but they killed him too. There were many instances like that. And so he, uh, he disappeared. Now, as far as the camps, of course, I don't know if you have any idea how these people were taken to the camps. They took them in cattle cars. To this day, I don't like to see a cattle car. In fact, I went to the, anybody been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? Okay, remember there was a, a cattle car on the third floor? Well, I went and uh, instead of just looking at it, I got on it and that was it. That's all she wrote. They had to carry me out of there. <laughs> I freaked. What they did is they put people on the cattle car and they put so many of them on that they all had to be up, upright. There was no place to sit or lay down or anything. So even the people, and sometimes it took a week or more to get to where they were going. So people died. But if they died, they were still upright because there was not even a place for them to fall. And this is all documented. This is not a story that somebody made up. So, uh, and there were some, some Nazis, of course, that would be singing songs and what have you and waving flags. And then there were the mm -hmm. other Germans. Little old farmer's wife, a teenager, somebody here and there. And they would go and they would stand at the corners of the curves where the train had to slow down. And they would take a piece of bread or an apple and push it through the, through the slats on the cattle car. Probably didn't do any good for anybody, but it was the thought that, that they cared. And then of course, when they got to the concentration camp, half of them were killed right the same day that weren't already dead and others weren't. I uh, brought some pictures for you to look at, if you're interested. They're not pretty pictures, but they're awful. And so when they uh, first started with the, the gas chambers, we've all heard of the gas chambers, of course. They were like a big gymnasium without windows. And it had shower heads all over. And the first couple of times people were happy to go in there, only the first couple of times because they didn't know any better. They were told they were going to be getting a shower and be deloused. Mm -hmm. And they'd lead them in there and then they'd seal it up, put in as many as they could, and then they'd seal it up. And then they turn on the shower heads. Problem is, there was no hot or cold water coming out. The only thing came out of the shower heads was Cyclone B gas. And of course, they all died. Probably took some of them longer than others. Maybe the little kids died faster than their parents, who knows. I don't know what date my mother and my little brother were in one of them, but it doesn't matter. They never came back, so. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's how the gas chambers worked. And then they had a uh, uh, group of uh, concentration camp inmates that had to empty them out afterwards. And for a while, they would go and they would burn the bodies. Well, that was fine and dandy, but all of a sudden they couldn't do that anymore because there was just too many. Like in 1943 on June 25th, they started four new gas chambers and crematoriums in Auschwitz. And the gas chambers had a capacity of 
4,756 bodies a day. And they had four of those. So you got mm -hmm. close to 20,000 people a day. And they just couldn't burn them. So they piled them, and I will show you the pictures of the piled up bodies that acres and acres, and I'm serious, acres and acres of skeletons and bodies were laying around when the Allies finally opened the camps. And I've talked to some soldiers that were amongst the ones that opened the camp, and believe me, they never forgot. They still have nightmares just like I do. It's something you never get over completely. Uh, one day, then General Eisenhower, General Omar Bradley, and uh, Montgomery, I think they were called Field Marshal or something, Montgomery from England, went to one of the camp and they saw all these acres and acres of skeletons laying there. And they said, well, they have to be buried. Somebody has to bury them. So they told the soldiers to line up, round up the people in the villages around there. And guess what? With all of that burning and killing and everything else, nobody had ever heard, seen, or smelled anything in all those years. None of these people knew a thing about it. They didn't see the trains coming, nothing. Well, these generals decided that was just too darn bad and they made all of these people around there bury them in mass graves, of course. And I have to prove on that too. They had them actually, they rounded them up and they made them bury them. And of course, like I said, none of these people had clue that anything like that was going on in their area. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a place like, oh, let's say Dubuque, Iowa, where there is a big uh, slaughterhouse company. Well, I tell you, if it's raining or windy, don't leave your windows open. And if you're driving there, roll up the windows on your car because even before you get any worse near, you're going to smell it. And that's just a slaughterhouse where maybe they kill 100 cows a week or something, whatever, I don't know the numbers. And you can smell that all over. So for these people to say they never knew anything, no way. But then, of course, it's like anything else, the day after... Uh, World War II was over, you could not find a single Nazi any place in Germany, there weren't any. But uh, one of those things that, uh, like I said, to me one of the worst can't things was getting kicked out of school. And after I, uh, after it was over, we tried to find my mother and my brother and some others and never had any luck. Now, one of the things that did, that the Nazis did, which probably sounds ridiculous, they measured our hands. Somehow our hands were supposed to show them whether we were Jewish or not. Why? I don't know. But that's what they did. They measured around our head to see if we had a different size head because we were Jewish. Silly, isn't it? They were going to do, go after our noses, and then they found out that the Greeks and Italians had bigger noses than the Jews. So. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. And so they, they stopped that. And that, too, was you know ridiculous, but they did do that. And I don't know how some of these people that spent years and years in the concentration camp, how they the ones that survived, well, maybe they were alive, but did they really survive? I don't know. I don't know how far back you can see. For instance, this is the opening of a gas chamber after a gassing. What you see there 
Sarah, you want to go alongside and, and show it a little closer up? This is, these are bodies. I'm looking at some of them that you could say they survived. Oh. You really can't you want to pass it along. Oh yeah, here's one of the hands. <laughs> the one that survived that gets to me, if I can find it. That gave me nightmares when I first saw it. It's this one. Oh. Whether that child actually kept on living after, I don't know. Yeah. It was alive when they found it, but. I'm gonna pass it around. Here is one of those channels I was telling you about when they first found the bodies and they decided they were going to do something about it. And they did. I'll leave a bunch of them here so you can see them. You know, you can just come up and look at them. This is an entrance to one of the camps. And this is a sign that was picked up, put up at the Belson concentration camp, which was part of a bigger one. And it says, this is the site of the infamous Belson concentration camp, liberated by the British in April 15th, 45. 10,000 unburied dead were found here. So that was a smaller camp. There were only 10,000 bodies laying around. Another 13,000 have since died. All of them victims of the German New Order in Europe and an example of Nazi culture. One of the reasons that a lot of them died afterwards, of course, is they were already sick enough that there was not much anybody could do them. And then there was a, a tragedy that took a couple of days to uh, figure out when they found all these people that were practically starved to death, there was nothing left of them except bones. American, French, and Russian troops shared their rations with them, which in quite a few cases killed them before they realized what was going on because their digestive system could not possibly oh handle real food. And so uh, it was quite shocking to the soldiers that were trying to save them that instead they, they couldn't. But it was, was understandable that they did it. This is one of the ovens. Like I said, you can see all these pictures. This is some American soldiers finding some bodies, of course. Just take as many as you want or pile them up, they're gonna fall down. <coughs> Here's one that's really bad. This is how they found a lot of them. Pass it around. Here's some lucky ones that got out of life and actually are smiling and laughing, which is nice. There's some more that just piled up on top of each other. Now I want you to know these pictures were taken by soldiers that liberated some of the camps. They're not Hollywood pictures. Yeah. I remember when they first showed a movie about the Nuremberg Trials many years ago. Most of you weren't even alive. <laughs> and uh, I remember a co-worker of mine saying, oh, I watched that last night. It's unbelievable what they can do in Hollywood. Oh. And I told her, I said, uh, some of those were not Hollywood. Some of those were actual documentary pictures. 
she got sick. Yeah. She couldn't believe it because nobody could believe that there are certain things like you see them in Washington, D.C. at the Holocaust Museum, as a couple of them. Like there's a mountain, a hill of baby shoes, little kids' shoes. And that, that, those shoes give to everybody. I mean, it's just shoes, nothing else, just shoes. But they're all little shoes. No, well, my, my brother was five, so. There's some more, it's an American uh, medic, I guess. You can just look at those when we're done. And here's some of these people that are doing the burial. Now, when I tell the younger kids, okay, you all like, uh, horror movies and monster movies, mm -hmm. and I always ask them, who is your favorite monster? And of course, most of them will say somebody like, uh, depending on their age, it'll be uh, Shrek. Mm -hmm. If they're a little older, it'll be Freddy Krueger. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Something like that. And I tell them no. <coughs> I have a picture of a real, real monster, yep. and I show them that. Yep. Mm. That is a real monster. That's right. Neither Shrek nor uh, Freddy Krueger could ever touch him with a mile. That's, right. That's what a real monster looks like. It's the only reason I keep that picture, otherwise it would be burned. <laughs> uh, when, I, when the war was first over, of course, you know, we couldn't find out anything about my family and many, many millions of other families. And uh, I actually did have a better education by then than the kids in my neighborhood. In fact, I helped some of them pass their college exams <laughs> and uh, everything. And then uh, I was only, 15 when I had my first job with the United States Army. One of the things that I learned during those years after I got kicked out of school was English. <coughs> out of a book, and when I say English, I mean I can't understand you and I have tomatoes <laughs> and potatoes for dinner. <laughs> so, uh, and I knew how to interpret. Not just translate, but interpret. So even so I was only just turning 15, they did hire me in the Army. <laughs> and uh, my foster dad kept telling me that someday you're going to go to America. And I'd say, yeah, right, sure, I'm going to swim to America. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like many others, I married a GI. <laughs> and I did come to America. And. I love having my kids. I loved having my grandkids and everything. I mean, those were great days. But there is one day that stands higher than any other day in, I ever lived through. And that happened in Jacksonville, Florida, of all places, which was just flooded last week. And that was the day when they made me an American citizen. me, that was just about the greatest thing that could ever happen to anybody. And I know we got lots of problems, no question about it. And we've got to be careful that we straighten out our problems and not go on doing what we're doing. And I'm past that age, so I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> this is the only thing I do is talk to you guys, but that's it. It's up to you guys, the young ones. And I tell the younger kids knew that uh, they're not ready for their weapons yet. And like that fifth grader told me, I know my dad won't let me touch his gun. <laughs> I wasn't talking about a gun. I was talking about a completely different weapon. What was I talking about? Hmm? Hatred. Hatred. Hatred, prejudice. Yeah, but what is the weapon we've got against it? The vote, the vote. Oh, that's right. Against it. That's the only real weapon we've got. 
You can complain till you're blue in the face. It doesn't help. Go ahead and complain. What's it going to do? The only option you have is come election day, vote. I don't care who you vote for, just vote. That's very, very important because, hey, things aren't going to change unless you change them. And people say, how could it ever get to that point? Well, you know, you have a friend, and that friend doesn't like a certain ethnic group and tells you a joke about it. <clears throat> yeah. And you laugh. Guess what? You just started a chain. Mm -hmm. Because your laughing makes you every bit as guilty as the person telling the joke. Mm -hmm. And that's how it starts. Most people in Germany didn't even know their neighbors were Jewish until we started wearing the yellow star that said Chew on it. Then, of course, they knew. Did, just like you don't know where somebody is from, you don't know their religion, you don't know their nationality, their backgrounds, anything. But that's how it starts. Just because you don't believe the same thing that somebody else believes. I have a, a, a granddaughter that cut off all connection with the family because some of us didn't vote the way she thought we should have voted. Oh. She's 30 something. It's America. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's America. But that's how it starts. That's how the hatred starts. And it's very important that you young people remember that. You don't have to like everybody. And you don't have to agree with anybody. Like, okay, so there's some football players that won't stand up during the national anthem. It's their privilege, they can do it. It's not against the law. I don't agree with them, but they have a right to do it. There's people burning flags. Not against the law. It hurts my feelings, but hey, they have a right to do it. Those are the things you got to remember. We have the rights to do these things. What we don't have the right to is hurt other people condemn other people just for being different from us. That's one of the reasons I still go around telling my story, is because I do not want this to happen here. People say it couldn't. I used to think so too, but it could. It could. I tell you, when I first came over here, just before I came to America, I had to have permission to get married because I didn't have a legal guardian. And uh, so I had to go see a judge and he gave me permission to get married because I wasn't 21 yet. Well, I wanted to come to America. I couldn't come to America even so I was married to an American because I wasn't 21. So uh, I went to the same judge and he gave me permission. <laughs> he wrote the paper and then he said, you know, we took your citizenship away when you were only a year old. He said, I'd be more than happy to reinstate it because you won't have any citizenship when you get to America. I told him in very, let's say, unladylike <laughs> terms what he could do with the German citizenship at that point. They took it away from me when I was a year old. They want to give it back to me now? I didn't want it. So the only citizenship I ever wanted was the American, which I got. <laughs> So anyway, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to ask or make comments because I pretty well told you all I need to tell you and the fact that you do need to remember. You know, there's a lot of people that still say it never happened. It's going to be difficult to change their mind. But then there'll be people that say, uh, <laughs> that uh, New York was bombed by Americans, that it was an American thing. 
you know, they'll say it, it was a conspiracy by some Americans. Some of them will even say the president was involved in it. Mm -hmm. The then president, mm -hmm. not the one now. <coughs> uh, people will say things like that. There's a question over here. What oh, city okay. did you live in in Germany? Pardon? What city did Stuttgart. you live in? Stuttgart. It's in southwest, I guess. Yeah, you got to remember, too, people say, how could it have happened? But you got to remember, Germany is only about the size of, I don't know, Illinois, maybe. Oh, wow. It's not, it's a little different when you have 50 big states. <laughs> so it's easier to, yes. I just want to thank you so much. I'm not sure to say this without crying. You have moved us all so much. You and your message are what all of us in this country, all of us in this world need. And uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, let's hope that the world will wake up. There's places now, there's the same things going on that went on during the Holocaust in Germany. And I mean, it wasn't just in Germany. I mean, some of the camps were in Poland and Czechoslovakia and so on. And uh, we can't change the past, but we should all try to make sure that the future is different. Okay? Well, thank you for your attention.